What is happening, my people? It is I, Cool Cat Jack, and with me is my co-host, Logan. Welcome back to the Knuckle Draggers Guide to Culture. Covering movies, music, books, TV shows, video games, history, and whatever else our tangential minds come up with. So open your ear holes as we give your dome some love. Nice, you didn't even wait. So as you guys can hear, two things. One, we're back after like ten months. Mm-hmm. And we have a new intro because I realized that as cool as our intro was, a lot of it really didn't apply to us. So. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, we're back, guys. And I don't know, I, I wish I could give you like a really elaborate reason why we weren't, but we just decided to stop doing it because <laughs> I got real depressed and just yeah. didn't want to do it. Yeah. But then I realized my 20 subscribers really needed my love, so <laughs> I've returned to you with something that I was really wanting to do pretty much from the start. But... Before we get on to that, with what we're going to be reviewing, we obviously have to do our uh, disclaimers. disclaimers. One, this is the show's not for children. As evident by that intro. You know, Jimmy actually might be an adult now, though. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's been seven years since our last upload, man. Yeah, no, Maybe. Like, ten months. Like, we're, we're slightly behind, like, Boffa Cake and Damn. <laughs> producing video. Yeah, take that, Boffa Ooh. Cake. Take that. I'm going to send this to you. Anyway, this show's not for children, so if you're a child, go away. Next, we're not experts. Mm-mm. We're just two dudes living life. With we're a gonna, dog. With a dog. <laughs> Who doesn't know when to shut the fuck up? She's just sitting here looking indignant at us. We're going to get things wrong. And if we get things wrong, let us know. Also, share us. Seriously, guys. It's, it's There's nothing more depressing than like putting a shit ton of work into a video and then getting like no response. Yeah, man. We're turning blue over here. Give us something. Even even if you've only watched the videos once or twice, just... just Send us something, you know, compliment us. Hell, even tell us we suck. We need something. <laughs> Get the analytics up so that we'll be paid attention to by our overlords at YouTube and BitChute and Spotify one day. We're working on it, guys. Oh, yeah. Once we have that, like, $20. <laughs> Since we're back, and as is tradition with us when we go on long pauses, we've decided to go with something completely aside that we never mentioned because, you know... Who needs consistency? Who needs consistency? Fuck consistency. <laughs> So we're going to be looking at uh, a game known as Downfall Redux. This is a uh, kind of point-and-click video game. It's on PC. Uh, You can get it on Steam. Part of something known as the Devil Came Through Trilogy. I hate that they call it that. It's like a mouthful. So we're just going to call it the Downfall Trilogy when referring to these three games. Downfall Redux is obviously a a redone version of it. The one we're looking at came out in 2016. There was one that came out in, like I want to say, like 2007. We haven't looked at that. I've heard it's very different, even as completely different voice actors. It was kind of a one-off thing, and then Harvester Games, that's the uh, developers that made it. Really cool guys. I love them, especially for like an indie company. I love their games. Downfall, though, Redux, is the first game in the Downfall trilogy. The sequels being The Cat Lady, which is probably my favorite, and then Lorelei. But we are definitely going to do the other games. I love The Cat Lady. It's my favorite game out of the series. Oh, man. I played it way too much. This game is a horror point-and-click. So if you don't know what a point-and-click is, it's basically like a puzzle game that usually involves the mouse. You get an item and you use it to interact with certain objects, and you have to figure it out. They're usually more focused on story than gameplay. So the thing about Downfall is, although it's considered a point-and-click, you don't actually use the mouse. Mm -hmm. It is all on... Keypad. In the later games, starting with, I believe, the second one... You can use, I may be wrong, Lorelei, definitely you can use a controller. And maybe in the Cat Lady, it's been a minute. Downfall, you can't. You can either use the arrow keys on your keyboard or the W-A-D-S keys. And then you can either use Enter to interact with objects or E. The whole game is 2D. The way I described it, it was 3D diorama with paper cutouts of people. I guess a good example of something that would be kind of similar to it would be something like the, what are those pirate games that were point and click? Oh, uh, fucking Monkey Island. Monkey Island, yeah. So it's kind of like that, except you just use the keypads. You can go left and right. Down allows you to interact with your objects you have in your inventory, which is needed because you need that in order to interact with certain objects to get things done. So, for example, in one part of the game, just to give you a flavor for the game, you need to get a human brain, but you obviously need something to put the brain in. You find a glass bowl and you fill it with ice, and then you take that and you put the brain in it. So the game is uh, pretty dark, though. That's putting it lightly. Yeah. It's in the vein of a 
Psychological like, horror? Psychological horror. It's clear because of all the references, and they, they've even explicitly said that they took a lot of influence from Stephen King. There's direct references to Stephen King. The main character, Joe Davis, I believe is a reference to several... Actually, a character, like it's a mix of several different characters from different Stephen King books. And they even have a Stephen King book in it. Yeah, Misery, which is appropriate yeah. <laughs> given the, the plot of the story. Mm -hmm. So for this game, we're basically going to go over the plot because that is the game. There isn't a lot of you know combat or anything. There really is no combat. So the story is about Joe and Ivy Davis. They're a married couple that have fallen on hard times. Yeah. So uh, mm. basically they're having marriage issues. Ivy has been acting very odd and Joe has decided that in order to, to save their marriage, they need to go on a vacation to the Quiet Haven Hotel, reevaluate re the relationship. Hey, everybody. So, real fast, uh, we forgot to put a spoiler warning, so I'm going to just jam this little bit of audio in between the beginning when we start spoiling this game. So, if you want to play this game without us spoiling the living shit out of it, stop the video right now and go play it. Seriously, go play this fucking game. It's really good. And play the sequels, too. Anyway, back to the show. There are a lot of characters that I could go over. I'll introduce them as we go. The prologue first, probably. Yeah. So the game has a prologue, which actually has very little to do with the main story. Mm -hmm. It's not actually necessary to do the prologue, but it does put a lot of things into context. Joe had recently moved to Britain, so he's actually from Seattle, and he's been living for about a year, less than a year. Him and his brother, Robbie, are having a conversation. R Robbie believes that there's a, a cache of money hidden away by some gangsters or something, right? Yeah. And Joe thinks that's ridiculous. Robbie goes off after the little conversation to go find the place. This is when you get your first bit of control in the game. You run across Ivy as a child. So you're both around 10, 12? I would say around 12, 11, yeah. 12. Uh, Ivy's a very quiet girl. From Sweden. She's sitting out on the sidewalk outside of a diner. So in the game, you actually have options on dialogue. Different branching paths. This is actually common in a lot of point and clicks where you can make different dialogue decisions and it will actually drastically change the way the game will fold, unfold. For most of them, yeah. So you can actually go up to her and be all shy or whatever. You can like hit on her really poorly. What did we say? We walked up to her and we're like, you know, if I, had, if I was a cat, I'd have uh, I'd spend my nine lives with you or some <laughs> shit like that, which is painful. Yeah. She, she likes cats because, you know, you do your bad pickup line. And, right. She says, I like cats. Yeah. You find out through conversation that her dad is not around. It seems like they had some kind of bad breakup or he mm. abandoned them or something. Because Ivy does not like her father. Her mother's inside eating. And, and the way she says it, you get the idea that uh, her mother is not a shy with food, as it were. Mm. Through the conversation, you bring up that you know of the place where cats die. Basically, Joe yeah. wants to impress Ivy... So he brings up that he knows where this cat graveyard is to get her to come along with him. Apparently is a good move on his part. Yeah, apparently this kid has got better game than I have ever had because, like, apparently he can just walk up to a girl and be like, yeah, I know this place where cats just die. And she's like, well, you know what? Let's go. <laughs> like, because I'm pretty sure if I walked up to a random person, like some random chick and was like, hey, you want to go see cats die? I don't, I don't think that would work. Uh, one thing we need to bring up that's a little bit odd about the prologue. There's a few things. One, it's easy to skip the prologue because mm -hmm. it basically starts the immediate second you start the game, it, which is a problem. It's basically the intro sequence, sort of, yeah. if you don't press any buttons. Yeah, so it's really weird if you want to get options first. I, I did not like that. The other thing, too, is that voice acting in the prologue is really weird. It's butt. It, yeah, it's not the best. It's kind of stilted, and I almost think that was intentional. Like, I actually think it was intentional to have them talk in kind of a weird way. Because the game is really weird. It has a really weird tone. Mm -hmm. The whole game gives you this sense of paranoia. You decide to take her to go to this cat graveyard. Yeah, there's a cat sitting out there. You pet the cat. You pet the cat. You can pick. You can try to pick flowers for Ivy, which she says don't do because it would kill the flowers. By the way, she likes red flowers. Robbie shows up and tells you he found where the cache is hidden. The cache is hidden in this construction site that you go to, and there's this... So it's the cement block... And Robbie can't move it, because Robbie is a bit younger than you. I would imagine he's around... Three or four years younger than you. At yeah, least. so he's around eight-ish. I would say maybe nine -ish. seven. Seven probably. A little yeah. Bit. So he wants you to help him move this cement block. So you go looking around the construction site, and you find a crowbar just lying around. 
One thing you kind of have to accept with this game is things are just kind of around things that wouldn't necessarily make sense. But this is this is a game that deals with a lot of dream logic. You know, it's a world where it doesn't necessarily make sense in reality. You just kind of have to accept that things are going to be rather convenient. Things are going to happen that, you know, would be really, really odd. It'd be really bizarre coincidences that things just happen to work out certain ways. What ends up happening is you pull back with the crowbar, you pull the cement block back, and you find a case of grenades. Just just a case of grenades. You're like, oh shit, we better go get cops. You're like a reasonable person. Yeah, let's get the fuck things. away from this, right? You and Ivy back up. Robbie, on the other hand, he's not playing with a full deck of cards, clearly. Robbie decides he wants to take one of these grenades and try to sell it. Which sounds like a good idea. I guess, to be fair, he is a kid. Mm-hmm. So we'll give him that. Maybe he doesn't understand how dangerous fucking grenades are. Uh uh-uh. uh. Also, these are the most fragile grenades uh-uh. I've ever seen. The grenade. He literally just drops it and it, it explodes. Oh yeah, Robbie dies, by the way. He goes boom. He goes boom. Also, that's like <laughs> the smallest grenade explosion I've that there were like 30 grenades in that box. That entire construction site would be in like a nine hundred pieces. Ridiculous. Grenades are specifically designed so that the pin is hard to pull out. Like Part of the reason why they have the lever there is it's kind of a safety mechanism to keep the pin in place. Crazy. And that's where the uh, prologue actually ends. Robbie explodes, and then Joe Davis says he never saw Ivy after that. Until he was about 20. Until they were in their 20s, where they uh, immediately hit it off and got married. This is where it gets weird. It's not just that. He claims that she, he and her never mentioned Robbie. And that she doesn't remember him. So this is where I had a little bit of my own little theory that I don't think Joe actually met Ivy in the past. I think it might have been a coping mechanism to fucking attach himself to her. Yeah, because as you play the game, you will find out this guy is, like, obsessed with Ivy. I mean, I know he's married to her, but this is, like, on Nutty. another level. This He's willing to do anything for her. You learn about him. He has, he has issues with losing people. Uh, one of the things is, is not only does he lose Robbie, but... You'll find out later on in the game that his mother actually committed suicide not long after Robbie was killed. And his father became extremely distant to him. Yeah, we don't know exactly what happened with him. He seems to have abandoned you or left you, and he he blamed you for what happened to Robbie. He even says, you know, was it so hard to watch your brother for five fucking minutes, right? You get the feeling that Joe Davis really has an issue with connecting with people. He also has some other things we'll get into. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so that's the end of the prologue. And then we get into chapter one. Although, I don't know why they call it chapter one, because it's literally the only chapter. Yeah. (laughs) So now they're adults, and their marriage is not going well. Joe decides to take Ivy on a vacation to Quiet Haven. This hotel is like the creepiest thing in the world, too, by the way. As soon as you step in. Yeah, there's like creepy fucking... Iron, cast iron gates you fucking open up. The whole place is decaying. There's like holes in the roof. There's all these fucking nightmare paintings, right? Like, Like, it's one of those places where if you went up or went went into the hotel, you'd be like, I'm going to find somewhere else to stay. Yeah. I think that place on the south side looks like a good place to go. Yeah, but as soon as you show up, basically what happens is heavy downpour. Basically, it's raining so hard you really couldn't leave even even if you wanted to. When you show up to, Ivy's just not talking to you. When Ivy does finally start speaking to you, it's very cryptic and weird. And she basically says the devil came through here, right? You know, he's going to swallow you whole and all this other cryptic, creepy shit. And and this is something else we can get into dialogue, right? So Joe, you can play him two different ways. You can kind of play him as more sympathetic. And who's... in denial. The other way you can play him is an absolute asshole. He can be like the worst person. He's like abusive. He comes off as Jack Torrance from uh, The Shining. Like you could play him full on Jack Nicholson if you want to. You run into the hotel manageress who is, she's on your dick the minute you walk through the door. This woman wants you and she is creepy as fuck. I've heard her a couple times and she gets progressively more and more creepy. And, like, more sexually aggressive. Mm-hmm. And the thing about her, too, is she's, like, way too chipper. and just. She also manages, in a way, to almost never answer your questions, the ones you actually ask. And she clearly does not. She wants you away from Ivy. So as you talk to the manageress, she kind of explains that there's only one room available. It's a two-bedroom. Ivy pipes up. Don't listen to her. She's a fucking liar. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Ivy directly talks about how she is... Absolutely, you should not trust this woman. She's got blood in her fingernails. She calls her a fucking bitch. And really, to be honest, don't trust her. 
No, seriously, if you yeah. don't want things to end horribly. Also, like, if you, like, follow through on her uh, ad- advances, which will happen later on, you mm-hmm. have a chance to basically act on those advances, and it really doesn't go well for you. Mm. It's- what ends up happening is she gives you your key to your room. She mentions someone named Sophie, who's in the room next door to you, and she says, don't interrupt her. She, she's not, she's a light sleeper, and you don't want to interrupt her. So you go upstairs, and you got your two separate bedrooms, and you have another fight. She says, just say things are over. And again, you can play Joe in one of two ways. You can be either be like, fine, it's over, or be like, I still love you. I'm not going to let you go, right? So you have your big fight, and then you go to bed. And then you have this really crazy dream where you, you kind of have like f- weird flashbacks in the game of things that have happened in the past. But at the same time, it may be happening at that time. So it becomes pretty clear as you play the game that Quiet Haven is not just a hotel. Mm-hmm. In fact... When you find out at the end, it's not even a hotel. It's it's actually the apartment you've lived in your whole life. Well, not your whole life, but like since you moved to Britain. Basically, Joe Davis is fucking insane. And you run into the Axe Man, which is a, a character that shows up periodically. He's he looks a, kind of familiar. Yeah, he looks very familiar because <laughs> he's literally you. The Axe Man shows up periodically. And, you know, he's actually a direct threat. He tries to kill you several times. Actually, does kill you at one point. Mm-hmm. You wake up and Ivy's gone. So you decide, uh, someone mentioned the Continental Breakfast, so you decide to go check if she's downstairs. Uh, When you get there, though, unfortunately, things have gone a little bit loopy. You walk into the room, and there's a bunch of people with, like, like dead people with masks. Pigs. Yeah, pig Pig heads. heads. Pigs are a motif in this story. Ivy suffers from some kind of eating disorder. Bulimia, potentially. Bulimia. But she she clearly suffers from an eating disorder. She, She does make herself sick. There's a lot of... A lot of areas in the in the game where it kind of looks like a bathroom. Mm-hmm. There's like literally a part of the game where you crawl into a fucking toilet. She's gone. As the manager said, she went to... Meet Sophie. She went off with Sophie like they were old friends or something like that. So she leaves a key on a desk for you. This is where we meet Lucifer. We mentioned Ivy likes cats. Cats are also a motif throughout the Downfall trilogy. Cats are almost like guardians, mm-hmm. uh, helpers through this like spiritual world it almost has like uh, the vibe of the under other world from like the silent hill games mm-hmm. where there's like this world atop of our world that can affect reality and it feeds off of your mental issues and your state of reality it se- almost seems like in this world perception of reality can actually affect the physical world not everyone specific individuals when you go to get the key from the manager lucifer has eaten the key Lucifer is Ivy's pet cat that disappeared. Early on in the game, when you're looking at over some like cat pictures in the beginning, Joe says that, uh, you know, Ivy used to have a cat, Lucifer. You know, I told her that I had to bury him. She'll never know what happened. So this is where you kind of find out what happened. Joe actually burned him. So the way the story shows this scene, because you end up replaying a lot of things, memories that are distorted by this world, whatever is going on, Mm -hmm. it it could be a lot of different things. This is one of those games that has a lot of interpretation. But in order to get the key, you basically set up this cat clock and a the furnace downstairs. It starts itself and basically burns the cat and you end up getting the key. And you run into the axe man again. So from that point, you end up teleporting back to the kitchen and at this point you have the key so you go upstairs and you talk to sophie now here's the thing about sophie there are more than one sophie so sophie so there's a few theories on who she is the one that i heard and the one that makes the most sense to me is sophie is actually ivy's mother are we interrupting your sleep there dog i'm sorry if you guys hear my dog snoring in the background hopefully you're not picking that up sophie one that's what i call her so there are four sophies Sophie 1 is probably the most lucid and least fucking crazy of all the Mm -hmm. Sophies. But she's still nutty. Yeah, she actually is incredibly suicidal. She wants to die. And she tells you that Ivy's gone and she was taken by the the monster that lives in the mirrors. So the monster that lives in the mirrors is basically how Ivy sees herself when she looks in the mirrors. She sees this bloated, distorted monster that just eats flesh and nothing, you know, mindlessly. She actually has you look in one of the mirrors and you see this thing. And it's fucking creepy see this thing in the mirror you actually ask her how can we get ivy back and she says you have to kill four memories and you have to kill her first she wants you to use poison so from that point on you have to try to take out these four memories Mm -hmm. so i'm going to go over the sophie's so the first sophie she's a little girl she as she says she's the last happy memory that ivy had of sophie 
Now, I don't think that this Sophie is necessarily actually her mother. This mm-hmm. might actually be Ivy when she was at an age where she the last good memory she had with her mother. But the next one we met was, uh, I think she's called Fat Sophie. Sophie 2, which you meet her later on, and she's like this bloated corpse. is basically like, I own Ivy. She's mine. You meet Sophie 3, which is teenage, 18-year-old mm-hmm. Sophie, who you don't meet her till much later in the game, and we'll get to her when we do. Sophie 4 is the least human. She can't even talk. She's just this bloated, like, mindless thing that eats on a couch. Sophie tells you to go kill her. you got to get poison, and in order to get poison, you need to go talk to Dr. Zellman. Dr. Zellman is actually Joe's psychiatrist, but this is what you're getting from it, yeah. Well, no, there's a letter from him that you actually can find that directly says that it's it's from his psychiatrist. But it's clear that uh, either Joe isn't listening to him or has stopped talking to him. The way he perceives Dr. Zellman, too, is pretty ridiculous. Dr. Zellman is the probably the funniest character in this game, which isn't saying much because most of these characters are you know, terrifying or just mm-hmm. really depressing. This game is really dark, guys. Dr. Zellman is hilarious, and he's basically performing brain surgery on this corpse, and he tells you basically that he's trying to bring this girl back to life, that she is the, the solution to everything. And he never gives you any direct answers, but he seems to understand more than anybody wh- where you are and what, what's going on. I want to go into some things that I have about him, but I, I don't want to do that until later because there are some characters you meet in the sequels, particularly Lorelei. It kind of gives me some ideas of what Dr. Zellman is. He might even just be a memory mm-hmm. that uh, Joe Davis has. Like, he might not even be the real Dr. Zellman. Dr. Zellman may even be dead because you actually find his body. In fact, Dr. Zellman may have even been killed by Joe. The thing about this game that makes it so difficult to pin down is that there's so many ways to interpret things that happen in the game. So Dr. Zellman tells you to revive the body. So what you end up having to do is you go down into this uh, one area where you find another body. And this is where the brain I mentioned earlier. You have to get this brain. You put it on ice. And this is where you start exploring the hotel more. You bring it back to Dr. Zellman and you put it in the body of this dead woman. And you flip the switch... And at first, it doesn't seem like it worked. And Dr. Zellman goes to go check the breaker or something, because it should have worked. Of course, the second he leaves... The fact that she comes to life. She comes to life. And then, at this point, you go to go meet her, and basically this woman won't talk to you until you get her address. This is when you actually have to kill the first Sophie. See, the thing is, too, is down in the uh, the, the area where you get you get the brain, you actually can find the poison. And you also have this another flashback with Ivy. I think this is where you see the one where she's in the bathroom, and she like looks in the mirror, mm-hmm. and then... She starts hearing this voice in her head that keeps calling her a fat little girl that needs to crawl down into the hole. Mm -hmm. Calls her a fat, disgusting animal. All this, like, horrible things, right? But at this point, anyway, you go go and get this dress uh, after you kill Sophie 1. Which, by the way, this is where you get one of your first choices. Basically, there are certain choices in the game that will affect the endings. As I said, there are three endings that we're going to go over. And we'll go into that when we get to the endings. So Sophie won. You pick one of two poisons. It doesn't actually matter which poison you pick. But the choice that does matter is whether you choose to directly kill Sophie. Or have her kill herself. Because she basically says, I want to die. I want you to do it. Yeah, do it for me. And you can either say, no, you know, you should do it yourself. I'm not going to kill you. Or you can say, okay. Either way, she does die. And she explodes. Mm -hmm. She explodes. Can we talk about the mask motifs too? Yeah, so each of the Sophies have uh, masks. They're slightly different from one another. I notice the further you get into how less less human they are, the smaller the mask is on their face. For instance, Sophie One is basically, she's wearing like a hockey mask. She's wearing a Jason Voorhees mask. <laughs> the fat Sophie has kind of got like this weird kind of... Like, Masquerade thing. So does 18-year-old so Sophie Three. If it's a little bit bigger, though. Yeah, it's, it's a little more taller. Yeah. It's more like a mask you would see at like a, like a prom night. Mm-hmm. Sophie 4, I don't think, even had a mask. Mm-hmm. She was a little weird because it was kind of hard to see her. She's in a dark uh, room. You know, I just got a fucking idea of what the mask represent. Uh, yeah? The evil to lie inside. The further, the smaller the mask, the more evil and distorted the person is. Or actually what it could be, too, is that uh, you, you see them in a more honest state. So, like, when you meet Sophie 1... She's just this girl rocking back and forth, mm-hmm. and at first you wouldn't perceive her as a threat, right? It's just a little creepy, but she's also the most sane. When you meet Fat Sophie with the smaller mask, you know she she only says a couple lines to you, but she's basically this big, greed. Yeah, she's just like <laughs> she's mine, 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 you know, Ivy's mine. You'll never get her back, right? And then uh, 
uh, Sophie Free. She's crazy, but she she hides it well. She's actually the one with the biggest plot twist when you're like me, because at first you're like you actually feel sorry for her. We'll get to her when we get to her. At this point, you go and get you kill Sophie one, and you get the dress, and you bring it back, and then you give the dress to this girl who was back alive, because apparently you can just stick a random brain into another body and they'll come back. <laughs> She has a funny bit of dialogue. Like, There's blood on it. Did you actually kill somebody? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a lot of different dialogue, but yeah, that's the one we went with on this playthrough. How do you kind of kill somebody? <laughs> yeah. So this is where you meet Agnes. And Agnes is an interesting character. So she represents a lot of things. Innocence. She, she basically represents the good parts of Ivy and Joe's relationship. We get this from what can actually be said at the end of the game. She's also like the most, she's actually the most chipper of all the characters. Yeah. She's the most upbeat. Almost to the point. Uncomfortable. Yeah, uncomfortably so at points. Like, she just seems to take things, like, she actually responds to what you're doing in ways that make sense, but she also remains even. Really chill after you fucking did these horrible things. Yeah, she even kind of sticks around and is like, okay, let's do stuff, right? Gee whiz. Gee whiz. <laughs> Which actually works because with all the dark crap going you on. You have to have a fucking. Yeah, you need that contrast it's like puck for berserk but unfortunately for agnes even though she just got her brain back and came back to life she immediately dies because the axe man shows up again and he kills both you and agnes also uh just throwing this out there dr zellman steals her panties you mm -hmm. actually find out her name is agnes from her as he puts it name was embroidered on her knickers we mentioned this he's, he's nuts but he's all like when you're putting the brain in, he's all like, put some elbow grease into it, boy. <laughs> he is such a chucklehead. I love Dr. Snow. <laughs> like, go on leg day, because he is like the skinniest fucking ankle. And also, I've never seen a doctor not wear pants or yeah, scrub he, pants. Yeah, he's, he's, wearing, wearing, he's wearing fucking shorts, and it's like, Jesus Christ, dude. He's wearing, like, shants. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, who would wear those? He's wearing sh Logan says this, he's wearing shants. <laughs> <laughs> he's wearing, like, black shants, and he's got this, like, doctor's jacket, and, like, the most ridiculous, like, novelty tie you've ever seen. Mm hmm So he's he's a goofball. But, uh... Which I think is actually intentional. It's kind of show, again, the distortion that Joe... The way Joe sees the world. Parts of this game is from Ivy's psyche and mixed with Joe's psyche. Like, the mm -hmm. whole hotel is around their problems and the things that have been built around the two of them. Because it, it's clear that the two of them have fed off of each other in different ways and kind of built up this really toxic environment. And and, and Joe is clearly the abuser. We're going to say that right off the bat. But he's so out of it that I don't know how much you could even blame him. Because the, the way, he sees the world in such a distorted way that he doesn't even... Like, you'll find out later on the Sophies are not even... Are not memories. They're not monsters. They're actual people that you are killing. Joe doesn't see it that way. He sees them as monsters that are, you know, have taken Ivy and he has to get Ivy back. And he's willing to do anything to get Ivy back. Well, anyway, so the Axeman kills you. And at this point, you get a choice. Now, you, you, do, you do play as Agnes and Joe. But at this point, you have a choice which one you play first. It makes the most sense to play as Joe. It's not a long scene, actually. Joe is actually stuck in a coffin. And he starts hearing voices. Surprise, surprise. Well, before that happens, though... Uh, he actually has another memory where he talks with Ivy, and she starts talking about how she was making herself sick. So this is where it kind of shows the different sides of Joe, the way you can play him. You can be absolutely terrible to, to Ivy, mm -hmm. or you can be like, you know, I understand, you know, I'm not happy that you're doing this, but I'm glad you're telling me, right? You can be very supportive, which is how you should play this game, you monster. I haven't played through, I, I've seen the uh, bad ending, and I really got to play through as the bad ending, but I really don't want to, because it's like... You're going to feel like shit for yeah, the next three days. It's terrible, and like, you do find out about the cat, so she basically says randomly after this really sad part, she says, you know, we should get a cat, right? And you're like, you're going to be like, I don't want a cat, or you're going to be like, okay, let's get a cat, you know, if it makes you feel better, let's get a fucking cat. And you kind of name the cat Lucifer. I don't know why you named the cat Lucifer. She hates on the name. She was hating on George as a cat name. And I'm like, George is a fantastic name for a cat. How dare you? The flashback ends and Joe wakes up in a coffin. And he's like trying to escape. And you get to hear these dead guys. Um, you get the feeling that they are the, the long dead. You directly ask them who they are. And they basically tell you they don't even know who they are. What do they call themselves? The Haven of the Rotten Flesh. So they basically talk about how they know you because they hear the maggots. The maggots talk. Funny thing, the maggots. Mm -hmm. So as you talk with them, they're basically mocking you that you're stuck, that you're going to die, and that it doesn't really matter whether you're alive right now. You will eventually be like them. Something's been left in the coffin with you. You actually find a gun. And this is where another major option is chosen, where you can choose to use the gun to kill yourself quickly, or you can choose not to. 
this does have an effect on the ending of the game, but ultimately in this moment it doesn't because if you sh actually shoot the gun, it's empty. You actually switch around to Agnes. Again, you can play as Agnes first and then do Joe, but it makes the most sense to play Joe and then play Agnes because of the way her section ends. So Agnes wakes up in this weird hotel room, and at first you're looking around and you start hearing this knocking on the door, and as you start becoming this pounding, and it becomes very clear that something wants to get you. It turns out it's the axe man. He's actually trying to break the door down Surprise. to kill you. What you do is you, you get the bed sheet and like like a quilt or something, or and a you curtain or something like that. you tie it to this moose head, and you start climbing out the window. You're like on the third floor, and you get down and you get down to like the window on the second floor, and then Agnes totally beefs it. She, she gets falls. up like nothing happened to. Yeah, her. she falls like thirty feet, just boom, and then and then she just gets up like nothing fucking happened. <laughs> So when you escape from the axe man, you're trying to, you kind of wander around this it, courtyard. It's like a courtyard, like a garden area. You actually find what I think is actually their car mm -hmm. outside, which it's funny because you find this car and you're thinking, oh, I can use this to escape, right? But Agnes can't drive. To be fair, you know, she's a zombie, right? She just got up, guys. Don't call her a zombie, though. Yeah, she does not like you calling her a zombie, even though she's totally a zombie. So you have to go and you can start the car because the keys are in the car, but she can't push the gas pedal herself i guess so what do you do you push over a nearby statue and grab its penis so there's this roman statue and this is just one of the weird odd funny moments in this game because this game just has really subtle but very funny humor <laughs> it makes me laugh my ass off so you, you push over this roman statue and there's like a leg an arm or a penis you can pick up you actually get an achievement if you grab the penis and use it and agnes if you examine it she goes maybe i should have grabbed the leg <laughs> But I always grab the penis because it makes me laugh because, you know, I'm, I'm infantile. This is another kind of funny moment. You push it down on the gas pedal. Yeah, at first you think it's going to crash through the gate so you can escape, but then it goes backwards because you didn't pull it up. It, it was in reverse, even though it would have been in park. Yeah. But uh, it, it goes backwards and crashes through this gate. And you end up finding this uh, building. And this is where a lot of the... Uh, Bathroom motifs really Yeah, started. so basically it's a giant tiled bathroom looking thing labyrinth ivy's prison it's where she's being held and uh, as you wander around you can actually see the axe man wandering around too you eventually run into ivy she's a lot more dismissive than she was yeah when she meets she doesn't know who agnes is and she basically tells you to fuck off she doesn't want anything to do with you she starts telling you about this maggot that wormed into her head and never let her go she calls it a god and a devil, and she won't let her leave. Now, you get another choice here. Agnes can either just abandon Ivy, or it can be like, you're coming with me. And she'll try to be like, no, just leave me alone. And you can be like, dude, you're coming with me. As you escape this prison, she basically gets kidnapped if you bring her with you. This is when you run into a character that is going to become a lot more important in the sequels. The Queen of Maggots. The Queen of Maggots. One of the coolest villains in any game I've ever seen. She's very interesting. She's got this like French accent and she's like this old crone woman that lives alone. There are so many ways to interpret her character. It's crazy. So when you run into the Queen of Maggots, you have a little conversation with her. And she wants you to eat this soup at first, which is blood. She only has a very small part in this game. But again, as you play the sequels, particularly the Cat Lady and Lorelei, she becomes very important, especially in Lorelei. That's when you kind of get a full idea of who she or what she is. I should say what. She was once human, but what she is now, you never really find out. Even with the last game, there's a lot of ways you could interpret what she is. This little conversation with her is Agnes, and she basically tells you Joe Joe would have eaten the soup. Joe is a monster and he's gonna he loves blood. This is when we start to understand that Joe is, and we'll get into this later, a parasite. The parasites also become more important as you play the sequels. So I'm not going to go into too much detail as to what the parasites are. So the parasites are mentally ill, really damaged people that are warping monsters, reality. basically. And warping reality, I think. Kinda, yeah. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. So they're basically monsters. Joe is becoming one of these. He's becoming the sixth parasite. So at this point, you have your little conversation. Agnes goes on her way. You run across the coffin, and you open it up, and you run into Joe. And you end up on the fourth floor. And basically what ends up happening is you kind of go over what you've already done, which is a very weird thing at first. Why are we doing a review of what everything that's gone on already if I've been playing the game? But what's interesting about it is... You can recall these memories, and you can actually, it contextualizes how Joe was thinking about these situations. So you can play it off as like, oh, I feel so bad about what's happening. I messed up. I should have been better for Ivy. Or you can be like, Ivy's a fucking selfish bitch, and this is all her fault. So, so you explain to Agnes what's going on, that you need to kill these parasites, that they're not people, that they're memories. And Agnes 
goes along with it. Pretty blasé about G O K. G O K. Like she's not super excited about it, but she does go, okay, I'll help you out. At this point, you're gonna start trying to kill Sophie two and three. Uh, so Sophie two is this basically fat legless thing sitting in a bathroom that uh, Ivy's mine. Yeah, mine. And you also run into Sophie three while killing Sophie two. Hmm. So Sophie three is this sad. 18 year old 18 year old is crying because this douchebag named Harrison fucking Harrison <laughs> if you play this game you're not gonna like Harrison and you're, you're probably nodding your head like fuck Harrison in order to kill Sophie too you have to get Harrison to smoke in this bathroom while there's this gas valve and basically causes an explosion but in order to do that you have to get a brain for the guy whose brain you stole yeah, um, yeah but anyway you get Harrison who is treats Sophie like shit. He basically says her ass. What did he say? Her ass was as the, wide the, as a train. No, no, no. The size of a football field oh, or something like that. Yeah. The best thing about Harrison, though, is like when you kill him, you can have like this goofy one liner. The one liner's returned, by the way. One of them is like, I guess he's half the man he used to that be. Was my favorite one. <laughs> I guess it's true what they say smoking kills. Right? You're fucking, fucking, like every single time, fucking Agnes is just like, Shut up, Joe. Really? Shut up, Joe. <laughs> and the worst, funniest part about it, too, is like you go in there because there's items you need before you can deal with uh, Sophie 3. Mm -hmm. You basically, at this point, you have to get all these ingredients for this uh, smoothie. smoothie full of castor oil, pot, a human head, fried belly fat. Mm -hmm. else we're That's about it. I think there was one other thing. Mm -hmm. but, but when you go in there, because you go back into the bathroom and like there's a hole blown in the wall so you can go get one of the ingredients... A head. And the recipe, yeah. of course. But Agnes trips over Harrison's leg. <laughs> it's just, she beefs it again, just bam! <laughs> like, and you're all like... Oh, Harrison. It, it, even it, in oh. death, he's still an asshole. Yeah. At some point, too, while you're collecting all these items, you run into Sophie 4, who... It, again, Sophie 4 doesn't really talk to you. She just kind of sits on a couch. So you get all these stuff for the ingredients for the smoothie, and you go back to this, like, party... You also can't do the party until you get back from, you know, the whole situation with... The crypt. Thing. Yeah, the crypt thing, because you have to get the invitation that Agnes has. She has this invitation that she had, had on her, but she wasn't able to give it to you when you first woke her up because you were killed by the Axeman. But she gives it to you, and that's how you kind of meet them all on this... I think it was the third floor. So there's four floors that you explore, and then the fifth floor that shows up at the end. So you, you make this smoothie... And you in the kitchen and like you go back to the party area. Yeah, you go back to the party area and Harrison is missing. His his body is gone. You had to actually go to his room to get one of the ingredients. Mm -hmm. You go back in there and you. This is when you find out that oh, Sophie three is just as messed up as the rest of the uh, the Sophies because she's basically got Harrison's torso laying on the bed. Yeah, and she's all like, oh, we, we've decided to reconcile, right? Oh, oh, okay. That's great. So you give her this disgusting smoothie. She has like the nasty... This game is very bloody, by the way. Mm -hmm. But this is probably the nastiest death because she like drinks it and then her stomach starts making rumbling noises like she just ate Del Taco. She pukes like pools worth of blood or something. And, and then she shriveled up and dies. She turns into like a mummy. Oh, it's so gross. You leave the room, and then you run into the manager again. But she basically tells you that she has something that you need in order to kill the last Sophie. The perfect weapon. Agnes tells you not to trust the manager. And you never get her name, by the way, because she never answers a fucking question. The manager is basically hitting on you. and is like, I got the perfect weapon for you, boy. So you got to go find her. Uh, the manager is on the fourth floor. You have another conversation with her. And this is where things get weird. Because it's weird. You have the conversation outside the room. And she says, come meet me in my office. You go there. And then you meet her. She, you keep asking her, you know, what the hell's going on? Why are you trying to stop me? She keeps telling you you should forget about Ivy. She says that I'm the little dark secret that you keep from yourself. I'm that part of you that resents Ivy. I'm the part of you that would like it if you could just have a chick, you know, doesn't have problems, doesn't burden you. I'd be the perfect girl for you. Tries to trick you into killing Agnes. She shows you like Agnes is this deformed monster. You actually find out at this point that you were actually the Axeman, which is not actually that big of a plot to us. Mm -hmm. cause it's, like you have a mask, but it even looks like you, you know, and you're like the same size. The only person this seems to be a shock to is, is Joe. And Agnes, yeah. I don't think it was supposed to be this like this surprise. Joe seems to lie to himself about a lot of things, mm. and you really shouldn't be shocked. 
So you get the axe, and you have a choice between either killing uh, the manager or killing Agnes, who looks like a monster. I've actually seen what happens. If you kill Agnes, it's bad. Right. And then you end up having to kill the manager anyway. But if you kill the manager, I, Agnes disappears, and she'll show up later. So you have the axe, and you go down to meet the fourth Agnes, who was actually moved from her original location. This is where reality starts to kind of slam in with, with what's going on. So it turns out that you never actually went to this hotel. You actually are still in your own apartment. You're just nuttier than a squirrel. You're just crazy. You dug into the apartment below you. I guess the people before it either died or left. Or the more likely route, he killed them. It's clear from what you see is the, the floor below you, there's a lot of stuff that's happened. And this is a little bit of a reference to the second game because in the second game, the main character, Susan, lives at a flat. And Joe is actually there. It's weird. This game kind of coincides with the Cat Lady, which is the second game, and kind of goes a little bit past it. Mm-hmm. So it's a prequel slash con- congruent story, part yeah. sequel. You take the axe, and Sophie Four's not there, and you break through this door, and you basically get a chainsaw. You end up back at your, your actual apartment where you live. The uh, Quiet Haven Hotel does not actually exist. You have like this At least the one you were there. Yeah, while you were there. It's all, this is all happening in the hotel or the apartment you live in. And you've been killing real people. While this is going on, by the way, a character kind of shows up way later in the game is Susan. So Susan Ashworth is a character that shows up at the end of this game. And if you've never played the other games, she's a little bit weird because she's just this character that shows up. But if you play the sequel, The Cat Lady, then you know who Susan is. She's actually the protagonist of the second game. And she has a, she shows up a little bit in Lorelei. So for Susan, though, she hears all this noise next door and she goes, oh, better go check that out, right? And she goes into Joe's apartment, start looking around. You finally, you get a chainsaw, basically. Like, you bring down the the axe, you knock down a bunch of doors, and you get a chainsaw, and you get to the final Sophie and kill her. There's this mirror in one of the rooms that has, with each Sophie, has been breaking, basically, and forming a silhouette. At this point, it opens up, because this is where the monster in the mirror lives. Joe actually goes to this place, and again, you're kind of switching between the Quiet Haven Hotel and reality, and you're switching off between Joe and and Susan. So Susan actually goes into Joe's apartment, and this is where you find out that he's actually been keeping Sophie chained up in their apartment. It turns out that Ivy has actually been starving herself to the point that Joe actually was caging her up and trying to force her to eat. We don't actually find out how Ivy dies. She's still really skinny when you meet her. So she maybe have refused to eat or she may have, like you see her body and it doesn't seem to be damaged in any way, but you don't know exactly how she died. But Joe goes into this mirror and finds Ivy's dead body. And he's basically like, uh, I'm not going to give up on you. And he decides he's going to take her to the uh, the room where you revived Agnes. So you start moving towards that. And it's a really sad moment. It's really sad. And this is something else we should get into is the music's really good in this game. I really like it. It's a couple people. There's like a band called Warmer hmm. that did a lot of the music in this one. And all three of them, actually. And I really like them as a band. Particularly in the, this is the second game, but they have a song called uh, The Noises She Makes in Her Bed. Really good song, guys. Beautiful. But yeah, so you take Ivy's body to the revival room, right? You actually take the elevator to the fifth floor, which, thing to note is, there is no fifth floor. Mm -hmm. You actually, in the second game, you actually go to this apartment and there is no fifth floor. So, in my mind, this is the point where Joe is just completely lost all touch with reality to any degree. He is just completely in his own fantasy or he's in this, like magical other world as you travel through this fifth floor you actually run into uh and the weird thing is is you take the fifth floor but you end up in the basement Mm -hmm. in reality that's the thing about this game is it's all over the place reality does not line up with this other world but that's not a bad thing it actually gives you a lot to think about right as you're going to go scrap ivy to this thing you actually run into all the characters you've been interacting with and someone else actually you run into um, Harrison, who basically says, you know, whatever, dude, give up on her. She ain't worth it, right? She's the size of a jumbo jet. So Harrison basically says, give up on her. You tell him to fuck off. And then Sophie 3 shows up and tells, you know, like, you always knew it was best for her. You know, and you're like, she was starving herself. I had to save her. Then you run into your brother, mm-hmm. who tells you that it's okay. You basically be like, this is your fault, or I'm sorry, Robbie, that you died, right? And he's like, it's okay. And this is where it gets interesting you can't necessarily chalk this all up to, oh, he's just crazy, because you actually run into the Queen of Maggots. 
who you have never met before at this point. Agnes met the Queen of Maggots. And she basically says, you know, this won't work, human. She's rotting away in her pit. You're the fit, you're the sixth parasite, though. You say, maybe you can change things. So this is where you actually hear the term parasite used for the first time. Susan also uses the term, which makes sense when you play uh, the cat lady. But at this point, it's this mysterious thing you're not really sure. And again, it's funny because the cat lady came out and then the redux, I think, came out later? After you talk with her, Agnes shows up. Agnes says, you know, I know what we need to do. Do you know who I am now? Joe says, yeah, you were the good parts of our relationship. You were that little hope I was holding on to that we could make things work. You're that happiness that I used to remember. And it, it, throughout the game, it makes sense because, you know, you literally give her a wedding dress. You're trying to revive your marriage. It's very literal, I mean, literal symbolism. <laughs> but it's, it's very on-the-nose symbolism. Also, it's really funny. You see elephants a lot in the game, like in mm -hmm. pictures and stuff, which is kind of funny. Uh, elephants in the room, so like the big elephant in the room, which is Ivy is dead, you know, and then she's dealing with all these mental health issues. And then black swans, which we actually looked into that. So black swans apparently symbolize, and I got to give me a second. Apparently, black swans symbolize an insight about yourself, which changes your position from one of victim to victor. They also symbolize a graceful reminder to move from any position where you feel powerless and at the mercy of external forces. So this is something from something called native symbols. We're reading a little, maybe we're reading a little too much into this, but that actually works for Joe because he is a character that is trying to deal with things out of his control. Out of his control. Because again, Ivy is dead. And she may have been dead for a while. That's another thing. She's been dead at least, probably at least for a couple of days. Like, my, one of my prevailing ideas is that he kept Ivy locked up, and then, you know, they've been arguing, and Ivy eventually killed herself because she's been locked away, and he just could not handle it to the point where he's like, you know, she's not talking to me anymore, and I have to fix this. Another thing we should mention, too, just prior to this whole strapping her to the electric chair thing to bring her, her table to bring her back, you run into Joe's dad. Joe's dad, he, he brings up Robbie and how Robbie died. He also brings up that Joe's mother killed herself after Robbie died. Because he was his favorite. She was her, he was her favorite. Yeah, he was always smiling. And you let him die, right? That's what he says. So you get this idea that Joe's dad is very abusive. He also says something else, though. He says, what's that there? You got another fucking dead animal that you're bringing home, son? So you get the idea that Joe actually goes around and kills small animals. Which is... A sign of a psychopath. Right. Joe clearly also suffers from some kind of delusion. Mental fractures. I don't want to say schizophrenia. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. He clearly suffers from hallucinations. He clearly has a lot of anger. Self-delusion. Yeah, he, he has a lot of anger. He has a lot of self-delusion. He's got a hero complex going mm -hmm. on. You can't blame the guy completely, especially given his situation. You know, losing at such a young age his mother and his brother and... His dad. That his was dad. Abusive abusing him and abandoning him basically mm -hmm. once he was an adult because what he says too is you don't see it, it makes a point to show that when a character is dead they're dead but you never see his father die his father basically says i'm going to put out my cigarette and then i'm going to go i have nothing here for you me you enjoy it yeah this this flat is for you so you get the idea that uh once joe turned 18 his father basically said you're not my son well anyway so you strap ivy to this electric chair electric table to try to bring her back to life Susan, we flash back to her. She's broken into his apartment. You see the, you see uh, a bunch of fucking mannequins and shit. There's a hole from... I mentioned this before, but uh, Joe's apartment down into another apartment. So he's been digging into the other apartments. You actually find out in the sequel and in this one that Morrison's old flat has been abandoned for a long time. That's the, uh, that's the flat below Joe's flat. He's been basically using these two apartments as kind of his hideaway. You see a lot of chains, you see rotting food that, like, Ivy clearly wasn't eating. And the thing is, is what makes it weird is that you don't know how long he's been keeping Ivy locked up. He was clearly trying to force her to eat. So we don't know why she died, though. I, I said this already, but it could be because she just didn't get enough nutrition and she wasn't getting help. Or it could be that she committed suicide, because there's... A few there's a things. lot of suicide symbolism as well. Yeah, like there's uh, a couple things where you see uh, cuts. Hangings. Like, yeah, there's, well, yeah, there's that scene where uh, you meet the manageress, her man or her office, and there's like her silhouette is literally a, a noose. Around her neck. And, and even when she moves, the silhouette doesn't move. 
actually would make a lot of sense that maybe Ivy couldn't handle what was going on. And she actually hanged herself. Because you do find rope, too, in the apartment. Now, he could have just been using that to, to get down into the other apartment. Or, but it could very well have been that Ivy hanged herself. So we don't know how Ivy died. Though. This is just speculation. Susan creates a weapon out of stuff nearby. And kind of gets down there and finds Joe. And she doesn't know what he's doing and why he's doing what he's doing. But she just basically assumes that he killed this girl. And he's he has killed plenty of people that night. There are dead people because of Joe's, what Joe does. So now we're going to get into the endings. So there are three endings. You have A, B, and C, the endings. C ending is known as the sixth parasite. This is the worst ending. And this is an ending I have never actually gotten myself, but I've seen what happens in the endings. It's actually almost impossible to get it unless you intentionally play bad. Like you couldn't accidentally get this ending. You abuse Ivy whenever you get the chance. Basically blame everything on her, treat her like garbage, say her you know, mental issues with bulimia and her, you know, her, the way she sees her body is just basically in her head and she needs to get over herself. Treat everyone like garbage. Kill Sophie. Try to shoot yourself. Treat Dr. Zellman like he's crazy, even though he is totally crazy. Oh yeah, Dr. Zellman shows up too when you're trying to revive. Because death Ivy. is a state of mind or whatever. Yeah, death is a state of mind, as he puts it. He's, I love Dr. Zellman. So in this ending, this is assuming that the absolute worst happens this would also assume that you probably got the worst ending in the cat lady. Susan goes down there. Susan hits Joe from behind with the weapon she's made. She notices that he's still alive and she goes, I've got something for you. And she straps you. To, there's a bed and there's an electric chair. So the, to the chair, it's strapped to this hospital bed. At first, I always wondered why it was set up that way. Why wouldn't you just have an electric thing strapped to the bed? But it turns out that uh, this is because in the ending, what'll happen is... If you get the bad ending, Susan will strap Joe to the chair and will electrocute you while Ivy's sitting in the electric bed, still dead. And she electrocutes you and she basically says, I'm going to shock the devil right out of you. Susan turns out to be a monster. She's going around just brutally murdering people left and right. Angel of Vengeance or something like yeah, that? Yeah, which is part of the bad ending for the cat lady. And we will, we're will we not going to go into detail on that because that would ruin that for you. But it don't go well for you. And it ends with Ivy and Joe's burned corpses like wrapped in one another like with their arms around each, each other. other. Yeah. At the end of each of the endings, it'll show you your score. There's 27 skulls. And you start out with a perfect score. And as you play the game, if you make mistakes, you will lose points. In order to get the worst ending, you have to lose all your skulls. You have to make all the mistakes and just be terrible. Like I said, it's intentional. You kind of deserve it mm -hmm. if you play that way because like Joe's an asshole. There's a newspaper at the end of each ending that kind of speculates on what's going on. And this is where I say that Joe killed real people. It says directly in the newspaper. Yeah, so there's six people found dead along with the bodies of your wife and Joe. And Susan gets away with it. And they assume that it was faulty wiring or like something. Wiring, yeah. In the normal ending, and the thing about this, guys, is the normal ending is the canon ending for all of these games. This is something that the guys that made these games said, was that the canon endings are the endings where it's the normal ending. And in the normal ending, you have to get anywhere between 1 to 26 skulls. You try to bring her back, and it doesn't work. Susan comes in, hits you, and this is when another character comes in that is in the sequel, Mitzi. Uh, we're not going to go into detail about Susan or Mitzi too much. But she comes in and she goes, oh my god, what's going on? And then Susan basically says, yeah, I don't really know. It looks like he's, this poor girl's been starving down here and he's been torturing her. As they're talking, the heart rate monitor that's hooked to the bed starts beeping. And basically they go, oh my god, she's still alive. But then all of a sudden she bursts into flames. The body burns. Joe gets up. So we never see what happens to Mitzi or Susan. Joe leaves the burning apartment with the charred corpse of Ivy. And the song, there's a song that plays for both of these endings. Here comes the Boogeyman, which is a good song, by the way. You know, it shows your score, and then it shows you the, the newspaper, where it says that basically a bunch of corpses were found. Five. All of them dead before mm -hmm. the fire. The four are obviously the victims, but I'm not sure who the fucking fifth one is. That's part of the reason why I said, I maybe it was the doctor? Yeah, it might have been the doctor. I guess that adds to the idea that maybe he came down there to talk to you and you ended up killing him, uh -huh. which actually would make a lot of sense. Dr. Zellman has been dead, or maybe dead. So you, there's a bunch of people that were already dead before the fire started. You're presumed to be the suspect, and you are, but you've escaped. You escaped the burning building, and, and what, what Joe says as you're leaving is he goes, Come on, Ivy, I know of a place where we can start over. Quiet Haven. 
we'll go to this little hotel and we can we can make things work. So it's implied very heavily that Joe is going to just replay this little tragedy over again. He will never accept that Ivy is dead and he will keep trying to bring her back. So the gold ending, you have to get a perfect score, which is actually almost is like really hard to do on your first playthrough if you don't know what you're doing. You would have to look it up. You could do everything right in the story and then still not get a perfect score because- You missed a note. Yeah, so there's these notes. There's three parts to this note. And the notes are a, a note that Ivy was sending to you. And I had this theory that it might've been her suicide note. Like it makes a lot of sense with the way she talks. I'm presuming that it's her suicide note. It recontextualizes some things that happen in the game. The first note you get is in the room you have your fight with Ivy in the beginning of the game. If you go back in there after you... It's either after you kill the first Sophie or you bring back Agnes and get, escape and get back to the hotel. The second note, this is the one that actually I think is the hardest to find because... And I almost did... I did this by accident because I tried to do it without looking. I remember I, I did it on the second time just because I was playing really cautiously. But there's a point on the second floor in the hallways where you're moving around where you'll hear this whispering. And if you stop long enough, this cutscene will play. That kind of show that implies that Sophie is Ivy's mother or Sophie is the name of her mother. And a bunch of other weird shit. Too. Yeah, there's like eating. It's basically showing the monster she's afraid of. Only after that plays, if you continue down the hallway, will you get the second part of the note. This is the easiest one to miss because it's very subtle whispering. And if you don't stand still for like two or three seconds, nothing will happen. It. You'll miss it. The third note part is actually found on the body of Dr. Zellman, who you find in the hole in the wall. Like when you blow up the second Sophie and you go into the, the back room, you find this head. Or you'll find a dead Dr. Zellman. Hey everybody, cutting in again. Um, this was actually wrong. Dr. Zellman is not found in the room with the shrunken head. It's in the same area, but it's not actually that location. To get doc to Dr. Zellman's body, you actually, there's a picture you have to cover its eyes. Sorry if you hear my dog in the background. You have to cover its eyes and there's like a room, but it's like right next to that room that you go into where Sophie 2 is. That was actually wrong. We just got mixed up and I just realized that while I'm editing this. So I'm going to throw this in there now back to what we were talking about. But anyway, so to find a third part of the note, you go and you find the body of Dr. Zellman. And once you have those three parts, you get you can you get the point that you're missing. Basically, what'll happen is, from what I understand, from uh, I actually looked this up. The way the system works is, if you get up to a certain point in the game, right towards the end, where you're gonna go and get Ivy out of the mirror, if you don't have all the note parts of the note, you will lose a point. But in the perfect mode, you try to bring her back, it doesn't work. Susan comes in, knocks over Joe, or like hits Joe. She goes over to the thing. You actually have this very similar conversation with Mitzi, actually. Ivy gets up, kills Susan, which is not canon, by the way. She does a little fist bump with you, and you guys escape together. And then the newspaper basically implies that the two of you are on the run. And that's the gold ending. So the whole story, even in the happiest ending, you're still a serial killer, basically. Yeah. There's a lot in this game. Uh, there's a lot of ways to, to interpret this game. Even though this game, I mean couple hours yeah if you know what you're doing the first time i played it it was about five hours and that's just because i didn't know what i was doing but playing through it as you know a second third time when you really know what you're doing you can cut that down to two three hours the longest parts are really the, the conversations and stuff by the way if you don't like dialogue and story you're not going to like this game this is not a game for people that want heavy gameplay this is a completely story driven game some of the issues with the game some of the dialogue is a little weird stilted Stilted. Again, it seems intentional, but the quality of the audio is different for different characters too. Particularly the prologue. The prologue is also an issue I've had. Replaying the game several times through now, it's almost unnecessary. You really didn't need it to play the game. I would say without the context, even without knowing how Robbie died, but knowing that he died and that your father blames you, you could have come to your own conclusion about that. The whole grenade thing's really ridiculous too. And then the whole meeting Ivy, but then somehow you don't know each other, even though that would be a pretty fucking memorable event. I think I would remember someone getting blown up. Here's the thing. If you're playing this game for the first time and you're somehow okay with having us ruin the entire game, I don't know why you're listening to this without playing it. Play it through with the prologue the first time and then replay it without it. And then come to your own conclusion. Because I have very mixed feelings about the prologue. In some ways I like it, but in other ways, seeing as it doesn't even affect the main game in any way, the endings at all, it's basically just a tutorial. It feels unnecessary. You'd have to play it to understand. 
Other things, uh, there's some moments where the game will clip or, and freeze. Like maybe you've noticed in some of the mm-hmm. events, like it won't shift right and it'll, the game will freeze for a couple of seconds and you think, oh shit, did the game just crash? Also, if you try to exit out, like go to your main menu while the game's playing, it will crash. And then another thing is, if you want a game that has a clear story where you don't interpret stuff, this is not the game for you. I don't consider that a criticism. I like games where they're open to interpretation, but there are a lot of people that get annoyed by that. Other than that, though, I loved this game. This is like one of my favorite games, one of my favorite indie games especially. I love this entire series. Logan, poor bastard, has to listen to me talk about it all the time. Oh, yeah. I played through... I played through Downfall probably four or five times now. I played through the Cat Lady at least five or six times. And Lorelei I've beaten once and almost twice now. I really gotta Lorelei's the one I gotta play through more. I did this review for an excuse so I could play the Cat Lady again. <laughs> even though I have all the achievements on the Cat Lady. The games are usually are pretty cheap too. They're probably even cheaper than when I got them. So if you're looking for like a scary game you can play that'll be a lot of fun, that's not a that's not hard, because it's really not very hard. This is a good game to play. You want to add anything? It's a game. It's a game. It's a game. I like games that you could read into, but, I, you know, I prefer games that are kind of straightforward, so I get it. I get the point of having games like that. It adds more of a bond between the creators and the audience, but... Yeah, I, I can see that. Like I said, this is not a game where if you want just a story, this is basically Alice in Wonderland meets The Shining. <laughs> you know, like, that's... Our review of Downfall Redux. The song for the day. So the song for the day we went with was... Little Piece of Heaven by Avenged Sevenfold. Warning on this song, by the way. Just like this game. Don't eat anything don't if you listen, have a weak stomach. Don't listen to this song if you like have kids around or if you're sensitive to murder Violence. or necrophilia. Because this mentions yeah. necrophilia in the game. Or Cannibalism the as well. Cannibalism. <laughs> I, we just picked this song because it really yes. it fits really well with this game. On to the next thing we're going to do. We're going to do Goblin Slayer. Yeah, so Goblin Slayer. It's an anime. Really good. It's actually one of my favorite anime, especially newer anime, which is rare for me because I, like, I, as I've gotten older, I've become really, really picky with anime, but I, I actually really liked Goblin Slayer. It's probably the most mainstream thing we've ever done, too, honestly. Yeah. Like, it's really popular even now. It's, as, it wasn't that long ago it came out, too. There was a lot of people fucking angry at it, though. Yeah, well, it has a lot of controversy. We're going on a dark bender, apparently. Yeah. That's... Anything else you wanted to add, or...? Uh, no. Not really. So, yeah, we're back, at least for another episode. Oh, yeah. You know, and I really enjoyed this. I don't know why we just... Didn't. Fell out of it. We got fell out of it. A lot of crap happens. Life. Mm-hmm. You all know. You know, all 20 of you. Y'all get but, it. Y'all get it. Anyway, I hope you're all having a good night. We're actually doing this at like 3.30 a.m. So. Yeah, who needs fucking sleep, man? I don't. <laughs> Play this game, guys. That's all I gotta say. Cool Cat Jack, signing out. Boy.